Many thanks for the organizers for the invitation. Riga gets better and better each and every year, nicer and nicer. Uh, it's always a wonderful position here to be the last one before the dinner. But luckily I was previously professor of European law and I know that much about competition law that we cannot successfully compete with dinner or something like that. So I try to keep my presentation, presentation uh, concise and relatively short. Uh, the topic is basically how EU membership of the three Nordic member states, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, has had impact on the Nordic systems for the protection of fundamental and human rights. But I will also flip the coin, so to speak, and discuss briefly about what might be the possible, hopefully positive, contribution by the Nordic countries to the evolution of, of the EU system for the protection of fundamental rights. And then at the end of the presentation, I will briefly discuss what might be called the Nordic constitutional resistance towards EU law to the extent that it has to do with issues of fundamental and human rights. But first of all, let me lift into attention certain characteristics of the Nordic constitutions. Although my focus will be on Denmark, Sweden, Finland, what I will say about the characteristics of the Nordic constitutions are largely, if not exclusively, applicable also regarding the Norwegian constitution and the Icelandic constitution. But primarily the focus will be on the Swedish, Finnish and Danish constitutions. Basically one of the lessons to be drawn from these characteristics in due course is that Nordic constitutionalism provides in many respects what might be called a constitutional counter narrative towards various topics that are discussed within the framework of European constitutionalism or, or, or global constitutionalism. Uh, Nordic constitutionalism also challenges certain well-established patterns of thinking about constitutional issues. For instance, it challenges the basic presumption that, that effective protection of fundamental and human rights rights, it inevitably requires strong judicial safeguards. Okay, so here I will briefly lift into attention these various characteristics first. First of all, as such, all Nordic constitutions have a long tradition of protecting fundamental and human rights. We have had broad or narrow catalogs of fundamental rights several decades or even almost 100 years already. And if we look at these various written provisions of the Nordic constitutions on fundamental rights, we are inclined to see that for instance, uh, gender equality, freedom of ex expression, including the freedom of the press, access to public documents, transparency, issues like that one are often emphasized alongside with, with classic civil and political rights. Also, social rights are in one way or another usually protected by the Nordic constitutions. And then there are certain institutional arrangements that needs to be emphasized. For instance, Sweden and Finland both, we have a very strong tradition of ombudsman institution. And, and that's something that needs to be emphasized also in the European context, not least because there is this tendency 
within the framework of the European Union to adopt increasingly various ombudsman institutions, not least European Union ombudsman, but also data protection ombudsman, etc. Uh, what needs to be emphasized also is that ratification record by the Nordic countries of international human rights treaties is very good, especially in uh, international comparison. Uh, whether we are talking about human rights treaties adopted within the framework of the United Nations, within the framework of the Council of Europe, or international labor organization, we have practically ratified all those international human rights treaties. Exception to the rule is only treaty number 169 of the International Labour Organization, which is about the rights of the indigenous people. And as you know, up there in Norway, uh, Finland and Sweden, there is this indigenous people called Sami people. And especially Finland as well as Sweden, we are still struggling with uh, land rights, for instance, of the Sami people. And that's why Finland, for instance, is still unable to ratify this convention protecting the rights of the indigenous people. But beyond that, Nordic countries are having excellent ratification record of international human rights treaties. And we are also often actively promoting the adoption of new international human rights treaties. For instance, we in Denmark, as well as Norway, they were one of the very first countries that created the Council of Europe and signed and ratified uh, the European Human Rights Convention already in the 50s. And also, if you think about Nordic foreign policy, international European cooperation, human rights issues are often at the top of the agenda, I would say. And for instance, the Finnish constitution explicitly obliges um, the state of Finland as well as public authorities in general to participate actively in international cooperation for the purpose of promoting human rights, peace, etc. And of course, at least in international comparison, European comparison, I would also argue that Nordic countries have a very good de facto human rights performance. Uh, there is a lack of any grave human rights violations. Of course, Nordic countries also receive every once in a while judgments by the European, Court of, uh, European Human Rights Court finding a violation of Sweden, Finland, Denmark of the European Human Rights Convention. But still, they are usually having to, to do with uh, certain aspects of the right to free trial, for instance, uh, for instance uh, delays of justice they are not so grave as, for instance, torture and, and human rights violent violations of that kind are. Um, so every, this and that seems to be pretty good in the Nordic countries insofar as we talk about fundamental and human rights. But if we look at certain other Other characteristics of the new constitutions, actually there are certain tensions or at least significant features that are not entirely in harmony with, with what we usually think about effective fundamental and human rights protection. All Nordic constitutions, they have traditionally this very strong deference to parliamentary supremacy and popular sovereignty. In all Nordic countries, democracy is understood as a majority rule. And 
it's one of the features of, for instance, Nordic exceptionalism, constitutional exceptionalism, that, for instance, I was just recently participating in this European-wide project about the topic of unconstitutional constitutional amendments. And I was supposed to write a story from the perspective of the Nordic constitutions about the topic. But there is total silence on the issue in the Nordic constitutional literature. Exception to the rule is Norwegian constitution, which has this world oldest eternity clause in its constitution, saying basically that, that the principles and the spirit of the Norwegian constitution cannot be amended. But if we take a look at the Norwegian constitutional scholarship discussing about the issue, they are basically wondering why the hell is this eternity clause in the Norwegian constitution in the first place there. So one looks in vain for any explicit limits of constitutional amendment powers in the Nordic constitutions and also there is a lack of literature on, on, on um, the existence of implicit or supraconstitutional limits to the constitutional amendment powers. What especially needs to be emphasized that Nordic constitutions they have this very strong traditional reluctance towards strong courts, towards rights-based judiciary view, especially towards strong role for the judiciary. We still lack in each and every five Nordic country a constitutional court, and I would say that even if there is tendency towards rights-based judiciary view in in all Nordic countries at the moment, ever since the 90s or so, courts still play a secondary role on the Nordic scheme of constitutionalism. Yet one more set of constitutional characteristics needs to be emphasized. One, is, one of them is the Nordic welfare state concept. Once simplified, we can say that we trust in state, we trust in public authorities, we think that it's up to the state to guarantee the well-being of the individuals from the cradle to the grave. We trust police, we trust judges, we trust civil servants, they know better the well-being of the individuals than we. We ourselves are perhaps thinking about the issue. And what needs to be also emphasized is that, of course, we are. We have this very good record of democracy, rule of law, issues like this one. And especially in Sweden, but also in Finland, perhaps even in Denmark as well, there is this consensual pathos. We always try to have this consensus about issues. And given also that there is still, despite this increase, increasing immigration, uh, there is still relatively Nordic countries, societies are still relatively homogeneous in ethnic, religious, and linguistic terms, despite this increased immigration. All this actually creates the situation in which traditionally rights-based discourse has not, it hasn't been non-existent, but there is not so much need for that in the Nordic societies up until the last decades. Now there is tendency towards increasingly having this rights-based discourse, making rights claims before the courts, etc. But the tradition is still there. 
For instance, in Finland in the 70s, even in the 80s, there was almost total lack of case law by the Finnish courts applying, making references to constitutional provisions on fundamental rights or making references to international human rights treaties uh, adopted by uh, Finland. And the same, I would argue, in Sweden and in Denmark especially, where, which is perhaps the last bastion of this idea that that uh, the role of courts should be limited. I would say that Denmark is still, still emphasizing these kinds of aspects and, and, and it's something as well. So one of the ma major messages is actually that up until the last one or two decades, 90s, 90s we haven't had need for right-based discourse, but now situation is gradually changing and there is increasingly tendency towards rights-based judicial review, etc. So if we think about what has been the impact of EU membership on the Nordic systems for the rights protection, that is perhaps the number one to be mentioned tendency towards rights-based judicial review and stronger role of the Nordic judiciary. That's perhaps the mo most important single effect of EU membership on the Nordic systems of rights protection so far. Of course, uh, the international human rights treaties with uh, the European Human Rights Convention at their apex is also creating and strengthening this tendency, but, but EU membership as well. Uh, if we look at what might be the positive impact of EU membership on Nordic systems of rights protection, I would argue first that beyond gender issues, EU law has had positive impact on Nordic anti-discrimination law, beyond gender issues. Also, I would like to argue that at least in Finland, environmental rights has become better because of EU membership, various directives, etc. Also, economic rights and freedom of movement has become better, even if we, had, even if we have this very strong tradition of cross-border freedom of movement in the Nordic region and the so-called every man's rights institution, at least in, in, in Finland, Sweden and Norway. Basically meaning that we are able to trespass private land, camp there, big swamps, making fires, at least a small one, and, and, and things like that. It's, it's out of question in Great Britain, for instance. You have to ha get license from the owner of the land. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is nowadays increasingly affecting constitutional interpretations and doctrines in the Nordic countries, at least in Sweden and Finland. If we take a look at the case law by the Finnish courts and Swedish courts, we are led to see that there are increasingly references to various articles of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and various judgments by the European Court of Justice on the interpretation of, of, of various issues so that the EU Court of Justice is taking into account EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. A concrete example is how, for instance, this Nebis in Eden principle, doctrines related to that has changed because of European law, because of EU law, because of also because of interpretations by the European Court of Justice on the Nebis in Eden principle. Of course, 
within this context, we have to take into account also the other European courts, the European Human Rights Court and its case law on NAPC need and principle. But not, nonetheless, this is a concrete example of such a one fundamental right or doctrines revolving around that fundamental and human right that has changed because of EU law as well. Furthermore, if we take a look at cases like Digital Rights Island, SREMS, Teletuos Varje uh, and Watson, we are led to see how they have impact on, on both Swedish and Finnish doctrines and interpretations of, of data retention, what should, how should Nordic legislation on data retention look like because of the ruling by the European Court of Justice in this Digital Rights Island case, or currently it's very topical both in Sweden but especially in Finland, the enactment of intelligence legislation and we are struggling with the rulings by the European Court of Justice in these three cases. Basically issues are how we can limit electronic surveillance so that it doesn't amount to what is called mass surveillance or how we can define uh, data retention obligations so that that it's not generalized data retention, it's targeted enough. So these are just concrete examples. There are more concrete examples as well, but I'm not trying to be exhaustive rather than just illustrating some of the some of the some of the concrete impacts of EU law or EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now this tries to say something about hopefully positive impact of the Nordic countries on the evolution of the EU system of rights protection. Well, perhaps it's safe to say that Nordic countries had a role to play when European Ombudsman was created and perhaps together with Netherlands for instance we have had some impact on such issues as transparency, access to information, good governance. I participated in the Finnish delegation that participated in the making of the first original version of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and I dare to argue that at least Finland was one of those who emphasized from the very outset that EU Charter of Fundamental Rights should be a broad catalogue of fundamental rights, not only protecting civil and political rights, but also protecting social rights, cultural rights, also saying at least something about access to information, the right to good administration, etc. So, and also Finland was arguing in favor of inserting articles on the protection of social rights to the Charter. But I recall that Sweden wasn't. Sweden was on the same boat with uh, countries like uh, United Kingdom, which was totally against everything, but, but with social charter, with social rights they found themselves, Sweden and United Kingdom, but their interests were totally different because while United Kingdom was more or less resist, more or less against everything to be inserted in this EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, Sweden was more or less having <coughs> doubts regarding social rights because it was afraid that the Swedish welfare state model system might somehow dilute because of this EU charter saying this and that about social rights. And so the interest was totally different from Sweden to, to oppose this. <coughs> 
this, this plan that social rights needs also protect, protection by the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. There are some pre preliminary rulings by the Nordic courts. For instance, Satakuna Markkina, Pörssi, Teletmo, Sverige, Ockerberg, Fransson, that can be said to have some impact on the evolution of EU law within the context of data protection and privacy rights. In so far as Satakunnan Markkina Pörssi and Teletua are concerned, Satakunnan Markkina Pörssi was a reference for a preliminary ruling by the Finnish Supreme Administrative Court, whereas Teletua Sverige was a reference by a Swedish court, as well as was this Ockerberg Fransson case, which was not about, not about data protection and privacy rights, but other fundamental rights. But perhaps these cases can be mentioned if we are after those rulings, those references for a preliminary ruling by the Nordic courts that have had somehow contributed to the evolution of the EU system of fundamental rights protection. Of course, there are other cases as well. I should have, for instance, mentioned uh, Viking and the Laval cases as well, but even if they are not necessarily the best cases from the Nordic perspective. One more slide. No. Oh, ah, yeah. <coughs> Final topic is Nordic constitutional challenge towards EU law, especially to the extent that it has to do with fundamental and human rights issues. I would argue that at least in case of Finland and Sweden, when we joined the European Union in the mid-90s, both Finland and Sweden were more or less concerned that EU membership might somehow dilute the Nordic standard of rights protection, especially in such areas of rights as uh, good administration, transparency, access to documents and that it would also be harmful for the Nordic welfare state model. Denmark already joined the European Union or European communities in the 70s, so it doesn't necessarily thought in that way, but, but, but Finland and Sweden more or less thought about in that way at the brink of EU accession in the mid-90s. Uh, in Finland, we have this very peculiar system of constitutional review. There is this ex ante constitutional review of legislation by uh, Constitutional Law Committee of Finnish Parliament. And already in 2001, it said and emphasized that we cannot weaken the domestic standard of rights protection when we are implementing EU law for instance, framework decisions, etc. And this was not only lip service, actually, because both in the case of domestic implementation of the European arrest warrant, as well as council framework decision on combating terrorism, Finland was not necessarily implementing those two EU measures in a maximal way it compromised the most effective implementations for the purpose of being able to observe some human rights and fundamental rights considerations. The Finnish uh, constitutional challenge is quite discreet. It's not so easy to see. It's not in the form of saying that this legislation is null and void. It's more about inserting certain clauses in this domestic implementing enactment so that it's more in harmony with fundamental and human rights than 
it would have been if this European arrest warrant or Council Framework decision on combating terrorism would have been implemented on a mechanic, mechanical way so as to try to maximize the effective implementation of these two measures. And of course, the issue is raised that there might be certain questions as regards the compliance of these Finnish implementing enactments with EU law. But then again, Finland was praised by the United Nations Human Rights Committee, for instance, in 2004. It was praising Finland that it tries to observe human rights while countering terrorism by inserting these various ex extra requirements in those domestic implementing enactments of these EU measures. So at least from the perspective of international human rights law, Finland was doing something which was okay. But it's a different story whether it's in compliance with EU law. Uh, if we look at Sweden, uh, some signs of constitutional resistance can be seen within the context of this okerberg fransson case. Because in that case, the Swedish Supreme Court first decided not to request a preliminary ruling by the European Court of Justice on the applicability of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. But later, this district court, Haaparanda district court, actually made this reference, and that create this, created this story around okerberg fransson case. But Swedish Supreme Court, for some reason, it didn't make this reference. And in Denmark, just quite recently, about two years ago, the Supreme Court of Denmark, for the very first time in this IOS case, challenged case law by the European Court, Court of Justice on the principle of non-discrimination on grounds of age. Basically saying that it cannot follow this case law by the European Court of Justice because the Danish Accession Treaty is not covering this kind of a transfer of powers to the European Union institutions. And actually the Supreme Court was saying also that it would be doing something against the Danish Constitution if it would execute the case law by the European Court of Justice in this context. It would be doing something ultra virus itself. And perhaps here we are again able to see that there is still this Nordic traditional constitutional hesitance insofar as strong role of Nordic courts are concerned. concerned. Nordic courts, including Supreme Courts, they are still using their judicial powers, powers against the Again, uh, they are still using their powers with, with what might be called judicial <coughs> self-restraint. And IOS case is perhaps one of the most recent examples of that. Okay, that was my story about the Nordic constitutions. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Any questions? No? Maybe I will ask one question, hopefully short. Uh, since uh, you, ha you don't have a constitutional court in uh, constitutional courts in Nordic countries, what could you tell, uh, what is your, in your opinion, this core national identity of, for example, Finland, which should be protected uh, in the case law of European Court of Justice? I mean, will it be like the highest standard of fundamental rights protection or something else? Well, that's subject to speculation because there is, there is lack of any discussion about the topic. Perhaps there is this discussion about Nordic constitutional identity. 
and then around that we are perhaps able to see some 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 uh, elements of the Nordic constitution that m m might need some special protection against this and that, including harmful tendencies coming from EU law or EU membership in general. Uh, but they are parliamentary sovereignty, democracy, the rule of law perhaps. Uh, then in Sweden, as well as in Finland, there are those who are arguing that we have such a strong constitutional tradition of gender equality, for instance, that gender equality is something that needs special protection. Uh, and this Nordic welfare state model. In, but it's difficult to say that it's a, how, it's, it's a constitutional thing as such. It's a political, societal, constitutional simultaneously and, and how to protect that is, is, is a topic that goes well beyond any constitutional discourse, I would say. process of EU integration uh, had an impact uh, uh, on the, the constitutional provision. So uh, the Nordic country changed their constitution in order to adapt their uh, legal uh, system to the European integration process? Yes, both Sweden and Finland, we have changed our constitutions so as to say a bit more about EU membership here and there. Especially Finland year 2000 and year 2012 amended its constitution so that it's already the first provision of the Finnish constitution is saying that Finland is a member state of the European Union. Previously there was this uh, deficit regarding EU membership, silence of of Finnish constitutions regarding EU membership, but uh, nowadays there is here and there explicit mentions about the EU, EU membership participation of, of the government and Finnish parliament to European Union affairs, etc. And the same in Sweden as well. Maybe I could just add <coughs> briefly. With in, so, sorry, in oh. Denmark, the Constitution is silent simply yeah. because it's so difficult to amend. It's yeah. still <laughs> more or less in this form in which was, it was entering into force in, in the 50s because it's so difficult to amend. But uh, in the case of Swedish and Finnish constitutions, there are these explicit <coughs> clauses regarding EU members. Yes? No, no. I was just going to say exactly what you said now, that in, in Denmark it was only by basically a trick. Uh, there was the issue of uh, royal uh, succession, whether that was preserved for the male line or whether one could open for the female line. And that was used as the platform on which to carry in the 1950s an amendment of the Danish constitution mm. so as to insert a provision that technically made it possible to join the European Union, or rather, as it was hoped at the time, with the European Coal and Steel uh, Treaty. And that just never used until 1971 uh, 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 for joining the, uh, the EU. But that means that that provision is entirely technical about the possibility in the abstract of joining an international organization. It does not refer to the values, norms, or identity of the European Union. It is a technical provision for allowing uh, mm. surrender of, uh, of sovereignty. And as you mentioned, since it is so awfully difficult, not quite Norwegian, but almost like the Norwegian situation, to change the, the constitution, it has never been, been done subsequently. A problem shared also, for example, with, uh, with the Germany. Perhaps a little bit easier in Germany, but not much easier. And therefore, in both countries, it's the constitutional interpretation that is then, almost in the American sense, very dynamic. For example, the text of the Danish constitution still reads that the king will execute foreign policy, and the king will do no such thing. He tried last time in 1929 and was almost 
taken off his, uh, his throne for the same reason. But everybody agrees, and now wherever the text says the king, it actually means the government. So living with that kind of dynamic interpretation of the text is mm. the solution in, in Denmark. Mm. Yeah, in that sense. Um, now again, I'm in a very dangerous territory looking at the clock. But um, I was just, I was just <laughs> wondering, um, going back, one of my favorite quotes by Aristotle is where he says that actually, if you're among friends, you don't need the law, right? You have a higher level form of social organization. And your presentation reminded me of this. It actually said we, uh, there was less judicial, less, less of a rights um, culture. But aren't we forcing you in the wrong direction and shouldn't we be moving into your direction, so to speak? Uh, sounds like we are force-feeding apples to everyone in paradise. Um, is this not something you're worried about? Because the system you, you described to me seemed pretty harmonic and ideal. Yeah, well, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, the it fact is. is that there is this tendency towards joining you others. Uh, adopting this increasingly, right, m more and more this uh, rights-based discourse, rights-based judicial review, etc. So this is a clear tendency in all Nordic countries since since uh, the mid 80s, 90s or so. Uh, in the case of Finland, Sweden, and Denmark, EU membership has played a role. But in the case of all Nordic countries, it played a role that when, when, when Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, they incorporated the European Human Rights Convention in the mid-90s. It was actually quite curious that, that although Sweden, Denmark, Norway, they were the first contracting parties to the European Human Rights Convention already, in the 50s, they did not incorporate that treaty into the part of their domestic law until mid-90s. All Nordic countries, or constitutions, we have this dualist approach towards international law, and, and that's why it was quite curious that it, was, it took 40 years for these four Nordic countries to incorporate this. Finland joined the European Human Rights Convention in 1990 and incorporated it at the same time. And Finland has actually adopted this practice ever since the 70s, that it's systematically incorporating all human rights treaties into the part of Finnish law. Uh, but Sweden, and especially Norway, and, and, and Denmark especially, they are not doing in the same way. They are not incorporating human rights treaties, and I would say that in Denmark, actually, again, we are able to see that this reluctance towards strong courts is part of the explanation, because they somehow tend to think that if we incorporate these human rights treaties into the Danish law, then directly or indirectly Danish courts will be empowered. They are thinking in this way. Yeah. Well, just to, if I may, just to add briefly to, to that, exactly what, what, what you're saying was reflected in the rather controversial explanatory uh, memorandum that, uh, that went with the Danish incorporation, which more or less directly said, well, judges, here you are. Here's the incorporated text. But now don't get too excited about using it, yeah? Uh, these are <laughs> main principles. Show some re restraint. Don't, don't, don't start exercising it. Of course, that was not the language uh, chosen, but that was the message that was given in very direct terms, and it was a highly controversial issue. Um, I read with interest about the recent new organization called the New Hanseatic League, which I think, uh, in which I think Finland was one of the uh, organizing forces. And I wondered whether that was linked to what the New Hanseatic League in the European Union, mm. <laughs> which, um, which um, 
proposed a different vision to what President Macron is proposing, which is to sort of create the EU's own budget with own resources and member states would all uh, mutually be liable for the debts. And I think the new Hanseatic League is to some extent opposed to that and offers uh, a different vision. And I wondered whether that was linked to Finnish constitutional debates and maybe the Finnish Constitutional Committee was once again active or, or not. And I remember in one of your publications it you mentioned it that been so active, the Finnish Parliament wants to know um, the wanted to know in EFS and ESM proceedings what the actual liability, the mm. total liability of the Finnish parliament would be. But well, not, uh, basically they are saying the same old story that they were originally saying in the context of European stability mechanism and those earlier uh, mechanisms re regarding Euro crisis. Situation hasn't changed, to my knowledge, in Finland. But I haven't been participated so so much during the last two years or so with these proceedings in the Constitutional Law Committee. But when it comes to these fundamental and human rights issues, then it's a different story. Yeah, I cannot say so much about it. Okay, thanks. Thank you.